Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag. O oh God, make speed to save us. O oh Lord, make haste to help us. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Praise the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. A reading of the 19th Psalm. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. One day speaks to another, and one night gives knowledge to another. There is neither speech nor language, and their voices are not heard. But their sound has gone out into all the lands, and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tent for the sun, which comes forth as a bridegroom out of his chamber and rejoices like a strong man to run his course. It goes forth from the uttermost parts of the heavens and runs about to the end of it again, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure and gives wisdom to the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right and rejoice the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure and gives light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean and endures forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey, than the drippings from the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant taught, and in keeping them there is great reward. Who can tell how often he offends? Oh, cleanse me from my secret faults. Keep your servant also from presumptuous sins, lest they get the dominion over me. So shall I be undefiled and innocent of great offense. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be always acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Here begins the 11th verse of the second chapter of St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create, create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and he preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, 
built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure, being joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Here ends the lesson.
The psalmist writes, unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. A lesser authority, but still an authority, Winston Churchill writes, we shape our buildings and afterwards they shape us. We have cause to think that this is the largest classical chapel built in 70 years. It's hard to prove a negative, but the one we can find is the Mars Chapel at Boston University, which was begun in 1920 and finished in 1950. 70 years. The question is not, why have we built this? Does it call out to you? When you walk in here, don't you look up and think of the ultimate things? The answer to that question is obvious. The hard question is, why have others not? It's not expense. More expensive buildings, this is expensive building, more expensive buildings than this are built every year on college campuses. It's not lack of example. Any old college campus, or any, almost any, has buildings like this to look at. Why do they not emulate them? That would need to be some powerful cause, something to obstruct that. I think it is the most powerful cause. I think it is a turning away from things that are beautiful, which means necessarily then also things that are true and things that are good. When the truth and the beauty and good are gone, then of course all reasons that demand we strive to become good human beings are gone. And with those reasons disappear the justification and requirement for human freedom. Also go all the precepts that guide us to the use of our freedom towards civilization. It is as if a plague has come over the land. And that plague has destroyed many colleges, and if it proceeds to its culmination, it will destroy this one too. But that will not happen. We can't really today explain all of that that I just said. It is actually the purpose of the activity of the college to explain and understand all that. And that activity goes on intensely now for 175 years. What we can do is say what caused this building. It was caused by several things. It is made of matter, stone and steel, plaster and wood, glass and granite. The marble in 12 varieties comes from, and, and some rose onyx, comes from uh, Carrera in Italy, where they're quarrying to build the cathedral, to repair the cathedral of Milan. The limestone is from uh, quarries in Indiana that supplied uh, most of the limestone that's in the nation's capital in those great old classical buildings. The granites come from Georgia, Vermont, and Missouri. The silver cloud granite on the fountain outside comes from India. The brass cross up here is from Spain. We like to publish that old essay by Leonard Reed, I, a pencil. And that's the strongest demonstration I've ever read of the utter power of the free market because actually this building has been produced by the cooperation of people all over the world who don't know each other, often didn't know what they were contributing to. This building has been built by people. Begin with the designer, the architect. Aristotle speaks of arts that are architectonic. It comes from the combination of arche, beginning, or rule, or principle, and techne, art. It's the art that commands. It organizes all the things under it. Abstracted from its chief meaning in the design of buildings, it just means ruling, art. Our architect is and is understood to be one of the best in the world. He is Duncan Stroik. He was assisted mostly by many people, but mostly by uh, Tom Stroka and Jamie LaCourt. His credentials are sterling. 
he went to Yale and Harvard. No, he went to, where'd you go? Where'd he go? It doesn't matter where he went. He went to Virginia and Yale. He says his teachers are Thomas Jefferson and others, but his direct teacher was Alan Greenberg, who's one of the midwives of the revival of classical architecture in our time. A very great man. Duncan can stand for all the artisans who've worked on this because he's the first and he commanded the others. I'd like Duncan and his colleagues to stand up, please. That caused me to look up and it leads me to remind you kids sitting on the front row, don't fall off. <laughs> Duncan and I are having an argument about whether those rails are too low. So far he wins. Uh, the fountain outside was designed by another architect. Uh, her name is Alice Arne and uh, she might stand up please. I happen to know that girl, and she will not like it that I made her stand me up, and she really would not like it if I didn't mention that Duncan Stroik helped her a lot. The builders built this building. They are weekend construction. They work for us a lot. They're awesome. They're losing money on this. They would be one of the biggest contributors to this. They estimated with their usual precision and skill, but nobody's done this in living memory. There's no one alive who's done this. And so they got some things wrong, and those happen to be things that are in their responsibility. They told us about it. They asked us not to tell the workmen because they were not, because they didn't want the workmen to change anything. Then they mentioned that maybe they'd hope to work for the college again sometime, and we told them that <laughs> that would have happened anyway. The workmen on the building, uh, we're going to have a convocation soon in here for the college, and we're going to invite all the workmen, and we're going to put a plaque up with their names on it here. And I will tell you that they work into the night. Mark, the supervisor, told me that he'd not been to his beloved lake for two years. There were uh, 60 people working here on Tuesday of this week. And they, I never see them stop work, except I come in and they come to see me and they want to show me something. And they thank me for the privilege of helping to build this. They made this building. My colleagues have made this building, working together for 20 years now. Rich Payway has taken the lead in, in uh, doing all of this. And so, of course, his, his responsibility at the East Arcade is not quite finished. <laughs> John Sweeney's hand is in everything here on the campus. The way we work together, David Whalen, Diane Phillip, Mike Harner, several others, we sat for hours with Duncan. They were delightful hours, too. Duncan is uh, very quick and intelligent and also stubborn. And uh, the plan emerged from those meetings and the building would be different without them. All of you built this building. Begin with Jack and Joe Babbitt. Uh, Joe said to me, she, she, uh, in a providential and embarrassing thing, she saw the little chapel that she calls a wine cellar now that was serving as a chapel here. The college has always had a chapel, by the way. There used to be one up in the top of Central Hall. It's quite pretty back then. And uh, we built the College Baptist Church in the 1870s. But we didn't have any chapel on the campus. Uh, 
except that little thing, and she just thought that was terrible, and she said, why don't you have a proper chapel? And I said, well, I've been waiting. We have a plan for one. We made a plan for the campus in 2001, and there's a chapel on the plan. And I said, I've been waiting for somebody to say, you need an excellent chapel. I would like to help you build that. And she repeated those words back to me. Think of what that means. Her name is back there. We had to fight to get that and Jack's. But Christ Chapel, she wanted it to be called, which is, of course, exactly the right thing. Jack and Joe, stand up, please. You'll see some other names on one of the plaques out there. There are not that many recognitions in this building. Most people didn't want it. But Bill Atherton and his family are right there. And people have been so generous, you know. And why do they do that? Same reason we do what we do here. That makes, by the way, all of you, that makes everyone who will see this ceremony, everyone who will take joy from this chapel, and that will be millions. It means that they are here today. And they are among the builders of this building. The faculty and the students are crucial. Because without the activities that they carry on, I argue better than anywhere on earth. How would anybody think that it was even plausible that we could have a building like this? And yet, because of them and their work, they fit. I thank you all. Even those kids up there, who I, I do hope they don't fall off, but, <laughs> but if they do, we can get more. <laughs> this building has a form. It is classical. What does that mean? Does that mean that it looks Greek or Roman? It turns out that the innovation of the Greeks and the Romans was to look beyond their own things to the things that are right, whatever their source or place of origin. That's not what it means. Uh, unlike uh, Duncan Stroik and my daughter, I've actually paid tuition at architecture school. And uh, <laughs> and I feel entitled to speak on the subject. <laughs> uh, classical architecture, I, I've uh, teased it out of them. They don't, by the way, they're reticent about revealing their secrets. They, they want you to think it's all just a mystery, because it is, but... They're like, especially Alice, he's much worse than Duncan. It has to fit in its place. It has to go with the things that are around it. We have a beautiful building right over there, 1852. Some of the most important things in American history have happened in there. Frederick Douglass spoke in there. The building points up. The ceilings are high. The windows are generous and arched at the top, like this. This has to fit with that. One of Duncan's innovations, because he, he knew all that in a heartbeat. In fact, he showed us pictures of some of the new buildings, because he didn't know they were either he's more artful even than I think, or he didn't know that they were new, and he said, boy, people who planned this college, they really thought hard about how to make it work all together. You have to live up to that responsibility. And uh, later, Whalen pointed out to him, I think, that he was talking about two buildings that were six years old. 
we were a little cocky about that. But it has two towers. Because if it just had one, it would have to be much higher than Central Hall. And that would not be right. So although it's much larger than Central Hall, it fits here in its place. The materials have to work. This is uh, yellow brick, the old thing here. I confess I did have a woman say to me one time, looking at Strohsacker Hall after we modeled it, she said, uh, Doctor, and is that a green building? And I said, no, ma'am, that building is yellow. <laughs> that lady was a donor. I don't, <laughs> I don't know if she still is. <laughs> it means more than proportion, even. It means it's right. Whatever it is that takes to make it right. It has to be like that. It's a classical building. It's like what the Greeks did. A blessing to all of us. We study that here, of course. I have one more cause to name, but I'll name it at the moment we dedicate the building. Right now, I will say that this ceremony would not be right if there were not the right kind of speaker. I don't know that I know another. Uh, we were talking about how we would do this, and I said, you know, the college stands for these four things. We're going to need somebody who represents these four things. Somebody has to have a character. Self-effacing, courageous, assertive. Somebody has to have learning. Do you know what he's accomplishing? It's breathtaking. I knew him before he got on the court, and I once thanked him for this. Because what he's doing is, in the ordinary doing of his work, and his joining in verdicts, and his explaining his opinion, he is writing an accurate constitutional history of the United States. And he's showing a way out of the distortions that have come upon us for the last three generations. It's just, it is breathtaking. If you doubt it, read uh, three opinions, my favorite. U.S. versus Lopez, Missouri versus Jenkins, and recent, uh, McDonald versus Chicago. And they show the way to fix all this, so far as the court can fix it. A learned man. It would have to be a man who loves freedom in the American Constitutional Republic. This man is the greatest liver, living interpreter of those things. And finally, it would have to be a man of faith. Somebody who bows in humility before God. Think of those things together. Who would be like that? Clarence Thomas. quitting while I'm ahead. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Arn, uh, and thank you for inviting my wife and me to Hillsdale once again. It seems like homecoming. We've been here so often. Um, the campus is magnificent. I'm honored to have this task of speaking to you all this afternoon or this morning. But I wonder, as Dr. Arn was speaking, whether I am up to that task, and I pray that I am. This is a very special occasion, this 175th 
anniversary of Hillsdale and the dedication of this beautiful chapel. Christ Chapel is a culmination of years of generosity, planning, and hard work. And the end result is at once stunning and glorious. The chapel's enduring beauty highlights the transcendence, the sovereignty, and the grace of God. It truly illustrates how architectural design can reflect the character of God and evoke a sense of reverence for his majesty. Everyone involved in the financing, the planning, and the construction of this chapel should rightly be proud. It is a magnificent accomplishment. But we have gathered here today not just to admire this beautiful chapel. We are also here to dedicate it. The word dedicate in this context means to set apart and consecrate to a deity or to a sacred purpose. To appropriately dedicate this, this chapel then, it is worthwhile to reflect on the purposes for which we are here. We're setting apart this sacred place on a college campus. The primary purpose of a chapel is to provide a place where man can enter the presence of God. It provides a sanctuary in which man can withdraw from the chaos of our world and seek a sacred stillness. For as Elijah learned on Mount Horeb, God so often comes to us, not in the storms, not in the earthquakes or fires of life, but in stillness, in a gentle whisper. Accordingly, men and women have long sought respite from the noise and commotion of life, daily life, where they can be still and know that he is God, where they can seek an inner calm and a transcendent peace. Beautiful chapels such as this one provide that sacred space for stillness, a place for an encounter with the divine. As the architect of this chapel has written, when you enter a church, it is as if you are entering through a gateway from the profane toward the sacred. It is difficult to overstate the significance of the role that this particular chapel will play in the life of Hillsdale College. Many of life's momentous events take place in chapels. Take weddings, for example. When a couple enters into the sacred covenant of marriage, they do so not only before friends and family, but also before Almighty God. When the wedding is held in a chapel, the chapel exalts the occasion and signifies that God himself is a witness to the couple's exchange of vows. Or reflect on funerals and memorial services. As we grieve the loss of a friend or family member and reflect on their lives, we also seek comfort, hope, and peace. Conducting that solemn service in a chapel reminds us that our deepest needs are met through God, who is near to the brokenhearted, the wretched, and the lonely. And as we are drawn to reflect on that eternal life beyond the grave, a sacred space such as this chapel, with an image of the cross, that old rugged cross, serves as a poignant testament to the hope of the resurrection. Chapels also provide a space for other important activities 
that take place on a more regular basis. For example, worship services will be held in this chapel. If our highest purpose is to glorify God, what better resource to provide on a college campus than a chapel that allows students, faculty, administrators, staff, and visitors to gather together for worship and prayer? This chapel also will serve as a setting for ceremonies and liturgical concerts, allowing all who gather here to learn together and celebrate before God. And the chapel will, <clears throat> the chapel will be used regularly for personal prayers of reflection, meditation, confession, repentance, forgiveness, and reconciliation. Chapels are particularly important in providing a place for the burdened, for the brokenhearted and despairing. When life is difficult and seems pointless, we need a safe haven where we can escape from the storm and find solace. Chapels provide that setting. They invite us to draw near to God and to elevate our thoughts, to seek his wisdom, to lay down our burdens at the foot of the cross and to find that peace that surpasses all understanding. For here we know we are standing on holy ground. In the words of a popular gospel hymn, when I walk through the door, I sense his presence and I knew this place, this was a place where love abounds for this is a temple the God we love abides here. Oh, we are standing in the presence, his presence on holy ground. This calls to mind Hannah, the mother of the prophet Samuel. When she came to the tabernacle to pray, she was barren but longed for a child. The Bible describes her as deeply depressed, a woman troubled in spirit who was experiencing great anxiety and vexation and weeping bitterly. But Hannah poured out her soul before the Lord at the tabernacle. And after a time of prayer and speaking with the priests, her face was no longer sad. She came to the tabernacle in anguish. She left at peace. Hannah's story reminds me of a young woman I saw some years ago in the church I attend near the court. As I knelt saying the rosary after mass, I noticed her crying, her shoulders jerking rhythmically as she sobbed heavily. We happened to leave the church at the same time. And as we did, I asked her if she was okay. Her face streaked with mascara. She answered in a quiet, peaceful voice, I am now. Whatever burden that woman was carrying when she entered the church, she did not leave with it. In the words of the letter to the Hebrews, she drew near to the throne of grace and she did so in a church building. I have no doubt that many will enter here burdened and like Hannah and the young woman, leave unburdened and at peace. Come to me all who labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. I humbly offer my own story that is similar, like Hannah, my life was changed through prayer at a time of, at a place of worship. Although I was raised Catholic and even spent four years in the seminary, in my early adult, adult years, I became greatly disillusioned with the church and made the mistake of angrily storming away, impetuousness of youth. Throughout law school and the early years of my career, I was self-reliant, so I thought, and gave little attention to God. But not long after I joined President Reagan's administration, 
I was in the midst of one of the darkest periods of my life. I was in my 30s, running a federal agency under significant public scrutiny and criticism. I had little money, I was raising my young son, and I was grieving the loss of the two most important people in my life, my grandparents. Life seemed hopeless and felt like I had nowhere to turn. In the midst of this hardship and grief, God drew me back to the church, and he used a church building to do it. It was during this period, seemingly bereft of hope, that I began to make daily visits to local Catholic churches to pray for wisdom and courage, as well as strength and guidance. Unlike the tumultuous world around me, the church building provided a place of peace, a sanctuary from the turmoils of my life. Within those walls, with God's help and grace, I was able to elevate my thoughts beyond my circumstances and self-absorption and set my mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth, as St. Paul wrote in the letter to the Colossians. God used these times of prayer and meditation to rekindle the flame of faith in my life. I am a changed man today, and God began that transformation in a holy place, a sanctuary which, like this chapel, where I could temporarily, a, a sanctuary much like this chapel, where I could temporarily leave behind the onslaught of life's difficulties and bring my troubles before the Lord. God used this renewed faith to sustain me and my wife through my confirmation hearings, and we continue to rely daily on the grace he gives us. But there is nothing unique about this in our lives. For many people, chapels and churches have served as beacons of hope, physical reminders of our need for God and his grace. And the presence of a chapel on a college campus is particularly important. In fact, in this age of popular iconoclasm, building a chapel on a college campus is all but verboten. The college years require young people to make decisions that will affect the rest of their lives. They are exposed to new ideas, new relationships, new distractions, and new temptations. They need a place where they can go to be relieved of their troubles and get their bearing or so their bearing as so much comes at them so fast. By building this chapel, Hillsdale College has provided that space where students can come to discern God's calling, to pray through difficult times, and to praise God for his faithfulness. In short, Hillsdale College has recognized the importance of equipping students, not only intellectually, but also spiritually, for the many challenges of life in college and beyond. Although a chapel is a place for many activities, it also serves as a statement about the importance of those activities. The construction of, co of a college chapel in, a particular, in particular is a public declaration that faith and reason are mutually reinforcing. And in 2019, the construction of a chapel is a bold act of leadership at a crucial time in our nation's history. So I would like to briefly underscore the, significant, the broader significance of the decision that Hillsdale College has made in building Christ Chapel. Beginning in the early 1900s, many elite private colleges and universities began to face questions about the continuing relevance of religious instruction on campus. These questions would have surprised the founders of those schools, 
many of which were created in part for the express purpose of providing religious instruction. But as time went on and schools moved away from their religious roots, the relevance of religion to higher education was increasingly questioned, and campus chapels in particular came to be viewed as relics of a bygone era. With the completion of Christ Chapel, Hillsdale College has staked out its position in this debate, and its decision serves as an example for all of us. The construction of so grand a chapel in 2019 does not happen by accident or as an afterthought. Christ Chapel reflects the college's conviction that a vibrant intellectual environment and a strong democratic society are fostered, not hindered, by a recognition of the divine. Hillsdale College affirms with the writer of Proverbs that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. By constructing this chapel, the college upholds the continued importance of its Christian roots, even as it respects the rights of each person to worship God according to the dictates of his own conscience. Our country was founded on the view that a correct understanding of the nature of God and the human person is critical to preserving the liberty that we so enjoy. John Adams wrote, our constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. He recognized that the preservation of liberty is not guaranteed. Without the guardrails supplied by religious conviction, popular sovereignty can devolve into mob rule, unmoored from any conception of objective truth. As I think about our political culture today, I am reminded of Ronald Reagan's warning that freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. We didn't pass it to our children in the bloodstream. The only way they can inherit the freedom we have, we have known, is if we fight for it, protect it, defend it, and then hand it to them to do the same. Each generation is responsible to both itself and to succeeding generations for preserving and promoting the blessings of liberty. Faith in God, more than anything else, fuels the strength of character and self-discipline necessary to ably discharge that responsibility. That is why I am so encouraged by the con construction of Christ Chapel. Hillsdale College's article of, Articles of Association affirm that inestimable blessings flow from the prevalence of civil and religious liberty and intelligent piety in the land. The college was founded on the belief that the diffusion of sound learning is essential to the perpetuity of these blessings. Thus, Hillsdale College was founded on the understanding that the battle to preserve and promote freedom in our country will be waged in the hearts and minds of the people. Rather than shrinking from the battle, Hillsdale is rising to the occasion by investing in the intellectual and spiritual development of its students so they can provide God-honoring leadership in our country. Let it be said of them what was said of David, that he served the counsel of God in his own generation. Students, faculty, administrators, and friends of Hillsdale, let this chapel be more than just an impressive building. Let this chapel be more than just let, this be, let it be a place where people enter the presence of a majestic God. Let it be a house of worship, of prayer, of meditation, and of celebration before God. 
Let it be a haven of rest for the weary, a place of healing for the wounded, a place of comfort for the grieving, and a source of hope for, this, for the despairing and the forgotten. Let it point to a day when the dwelling of God will be with men, when God himself will wipe away every tear and mend every wound. Let it be a place where tomorrow's leaders discern their callings and grow firm in their convictions. Let it stand as a bold declaration to a watching world that faith and learning are rightly understood as complements and that both are essential to the preservation of the blessings of liberty. Above all, let this chapel equip and inspire us to honor God in whatever he calls us to do. For as St. Paul wrote in the letter to the Romans, from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever, amen. May God bless each of you, may God bless Hillsdale, and may God bless this wonderful country. Thank you. <laughs>